Hello, and welcome to another installment of The Weird Chronicles. Each episode, we'll bring you tales of action and adventure from Malifaux and the other side. On today's episode, both Seamus and the Ortega family are hunting a hideous creature known only as Killjoy. But, needless to say, their motives are very different. I hope you enjoy Seamus and the Ortegas. Seamus and the Ortegas by Brian Emick Seamus stood at the top of the hill, his eyes moving rapidly as he surveyed the ghost town in the valley below. There was more of a way station than a town, really. A few buildings, mostly businesses by the look of their fronts, with a couple on the outskirts that may have been homes. Behind him, the bells stood in the shadow of a large tree, their eyes moving randomly, fixating on nothing. He knew Killjoy was down there somewhere. He had been following the creature's path of death and destruction for days. Now he would finally be able to... Movement on the far edge of the town drew his attention. He leaned forward slightly, even though he didn't need to. His eyes saw everything, even though the sun was setting behind him and casting long shadows everywhere. Dortegas, he snarled. From under the tree, the bells groaned and started shifting from foot to foot. Seamus closed his eyes, took a deep breath and slowly let it out. The ladies quieted. When he was sure that they would stay put, he looked down to the town once again. If the Ortega clan had shown up, that meant that word had finally leaked about Killjoy. Now it would be a damned free-for-all in bringing the monster down. Seamus didn't mind Killjoy being destroyed, He planned on doing it himself, but he needed information about the Neverborn from the creature first. He reached down and picked up his leather satchel. My dear ladies, he said, his eyes still focused on the valley. We're going to town. As one, the bells turned to him, a sigh escaping their lips. They knew they would get to feast soon. Perdita moved so silently and blended into the shadows so well that Francisco didn't hear or see her move up beside him. Still, his grip tightened on his gun as he sensed someone near him. Come, my brother, Perdita said, her voice so low that it was barely a whisper. See, mi hermana, he whispered back. I just don't understand why we need to be the ones to bring this monster down in this place. Because, mi hermano, we can. She smiled, her teeth practically glowing in the fading light. Francisco sometimes wondered if his sister was touched with the same madness that seemed to infect so many once they came to Malifaux. Between confronting the walking dead and the constant threat of the Neverborn, it was almost enough to drive anyone insane. He checked his gun once again, and then looked down the street to his right. He could see Santiago moving cautiously from shadow to shadow on the other side of the dirt street, closing in on the building where the monster had obviously entered. The wide trail of blood that led through the broken door left no doubt. Glancing up, he saw Nino move into position on the roof. To his left, Papa walked right down the middle of the street, While Francisco may have had his doubts about Perdita's sanity, there were none about Papa's. The man was completely insane, and it was for good reason they called him Loco. Papa Loco walked along the street as though he were out for an evening stroll, twirling his gun in his left hand, a stick of dynamite in his right. A cigar was clenched between his teeth, and the glowing end grew bright for a moment as he inhaled. Come, Ninos, Papa cooled as he approached the front of the building. Let us send this creature de Cassiata to hell. Francisco and Perdita looked at each other. This was definitely not the plan. Perdita started to step forward. Ortegas, a voice called from the far end of the street. They turned, their eyes squinting against the dying sunlight. Killjoy is mine. 
Gah, Papa Loco said as he turned. Before he could make a complete turn, a gunshot shattered the silence of the deserted town. From his hiding place, Francisco saw blood explode from Papa Loco's shoulder. Papa! Santiago called as he ran toward the fallen man. He fell to his knees and slid along the dirt the final few feet, coming to a full stop beside his elder. Papa! he asked softly as he cradled the old man's head in his lap. Francisco gritted his teeth. He wanted to move to help his padre, but knew that moving out into the street wouldn't help the old man at all. He was so focused on what was happening in the street that he didn't notice that Perdita had moved out of the shadows. She didn't run, didn't dash. There was nothing hurried about her actions at all. By the time Francisco saw her, it was too late to grab her and pull her back to safety. Instead of moving towards her fallen father, she lowered the brim of her hat and turned to face their attacker. Another shot rang out and Perdita moved ever so slightly. It was obvious to Francisco that the bullet had passed just above her shoulder and through her long hair. Her hand was a blur as she drew her gun and fired two shots. Nino jumped down from the roof and ran into the street. He grabbed the collar of Santiago's coat, trying to drag him to safety. Santiago's embrace tightened around his father's head. Papa Loco's eyes sprang open. Let go of me, Nino, estupido. The old man grunted as he rolled away from Santiago and half walked, half loped to the safety of a small alley. Shocked, Santiago let himself be dragged by Nino to safety. Perdita continued to fire her gun, and then jumped back beside Francisco. Who is it? He asked her as she reloaded. The voice had sounded familiar, but he couldn't quite place it. She spun the chamber and then snapped it back into place. The dead, she grunted. She stepped out into the street and started running towards their attackers. Francisco frowned in confusion, and then rolled his eyes as realization sank in. Seamus and his rotten bells. He snarled and ran after his sister. Seamus was sure that he had killed the old man, but the crazy bastard had gotten up and walked away. He cursed as another bullet whizzed past his head. He had to hand it to the Ortegas. They could shoot. The only reason he was still standing was because the setting sun was in their eyes, making it difficult to get an accurate shot. However, he knew that the sun would drop below the hill above the town within a few minutes, and then he would be a standing target. He focused his mind on the bells standing behind him. They moved into the town, going in separate directions. Another shot rang out and his top hat flew off his head. He cursed as he snatched it from the ground and moved behind a building. My hat. They shot my beautiful hat. And they'll pay for that. He glanced around the corner, taking in the street. The woman, Perdita, he thought, was a block away, walking down the wooden sidewalk with her gun held in front of her. The brim of her hat was so low that he could only see her lips and chin, but she obviously could see him. She fired another shot, splintering the wood near his head. He ducked back sank to his knees, leaned around the corner again, and fired. She moved to one side and pressed her body against the window of the building. The glass around her shattered as suddenly as one of the bells broke through it and grabbed her. Perdita tried to move as she heard the glass breaking, but the arms, though dead, were still quick and strong. The bell pulled her through the broken window, cutting her arms and back as she was thrown into the room. As she landed, Perdita rolled and came up with her gun in front of her. One of the bells, dressed in a purple dress that had probably been very fine and fancy at one time, but was now nothing more than tattered rags, glared at her with eyes that were dead but could still see. The bell hissed at her, moving from side to side, looking more like an animal than a human being. The purple parasol in her left hand twitched, as though she were preparing to attack with it. Perdita fired a shot into the thing's head, snapping it back. 
The bell's eyes came back to Perdita's face, the foul thing still hissing and moving slightly. Down! A voice called out. Perdita dropped to the dust-covered floor as a loud shot deafened her. The bell's head disappeared in a shower of blood, bone and brains. The body swayed for a moment, then collapsed in a heap on the floor. Nino jumped into the building. You brought boomers, Perdita said as Nino helped her up. Indeed, he answered. He kicked the bell in the side, then spat on it. How is Papa? she asked. Alive, he answered as he moved to the broken window. He brought his gun up and leapt out onto the wooden sidewalk. Perdita followed him, and the two of them ran up the walkway to the corner where Seamus had been just moments before. Other than some disturbed dirt, there wasn't any sign of the madman. Perdita glanced around. Where did Francisco go? Francisco had followed his sister part way up the street, but then he had spotted something moving between two of the buildings. He ran into the narrow alleyway, his guns at the ready. At the other end he could see tracks in the dirt. Whatever it was had been shuffling along instead of walking, and that meant it had been one of the bells. He stepped out of the alley, his eyes moving quickly around the area. There wasn't any sign of the bell, but the stink of rotting flesh still hung in the air. In fact, the stench was growing even worse. He quickly ducked to the ground and rolled. When he came back up, his guns were pointing at the head of one of the bells. It was a torn and tattered pink dress. An open pink parasol was in one of its dead hands. In its other hand was a large pink fan. Its dead eyes focused on his. It lunged towards him, arms outstretched. He stepped to one side and fired both guns at once. The bullets punctured the bell in the right side, but didn't slow it down. With amazing speed it spun around, hitting him in the face with the parasol. He grunted in pain as one of the wire supports cut his face. He stumbled briefly and hit a wall with his shoulder, his left arm tingling from the impact. He glanced over his shoulder as the bell approached him again. He kicked out with his right foot catching the undead creature in the stomach. It took two shambling steps back and paused for a moment. It was all the opening he needed. Francisco turned, brought his guns up, pushed away from the wall and started firing. Bullets tore through the thing's head, destroying it. He breathed heavily as the undead thing fell to the ground. He was so focused on it, he didn't hear another bell come up behind him. It brought its parasol up, and drove the point down into his back. Francisco screamed as the sharp metal tip tore through his clothing and sank into his flesh. He fell forward, and the bell fell on top of him, her fingernails tearing through his coat and shirt. Francisco struggled to get it off him, but the dead weight, combined with the way it was writhing on top of him, made it impossible for him to turn over. He could feel his blood running freely, soaking his shirt. In a final, desperate attempt, he bucked as hard as he could to free himself from the thing's grasp. The bell's hold slipped momentarily. Francisco started to turn over, but a sharp blow landed on the back of his head. The only thought that went through his mind before the world went dark was, I hope I stay dead. Seamus looked down at the unconscious Ortega, as Mary pulled her parasol from his back and retrieved her fan before opening her parasol and letting it rest lightly on her shoulder. Bring him, Seamus said as he walked away. Mary looked from one hand to the other, uncertain what she should do. Seamus sensed her momentary confusion. He turned around and gently took the fan from her. A look of sadness crossed her face until he showed her that he was only folding it and putting it in one of the lesser-torn pockets of her ragged dress. She bent over, grabbed one of Francisco's legs and dragged him as she followed Seamus down the alley. At the other end, Seamus looked around. There wasn't any sign of the other Ortegas, but he knew he still had to be careful. Just a few feet away to his left stood an open doorway to one of the buildings. Sibel, he thought, I need you here. Now. 
Within minutes, the large, bald woman, perhaps pretty when she still lived, walked up behind Mary. Another quick look at the street told him that it was now or never. If any of the Ortegas were able to spot him in the growing darkness, then he would have already been shot. He moved down the sidewalk towards the open door, Sibel directly behind him, while Mary brought up the rear, dragging Francisco. They ducked inside the building. It had obviously once been a store of some kind. There was a counter to the right of the door and several empty shelves were along the far wall. In the far corner to the left was a small round table with two chairs beside it. Put him there. Seamus pointed to one of the chairs. After Mary shuffled over to the corner, she tried to pick Francisco up. However, his weight was too much for her lifeless arms. Sibel moved over, picked him up with one hand and dropped him in the chair. As Sibel moved back towards Seamus, a gunshot rang out. The bullet grazed Sibel's head just above her left ear, flaying open her scalp. Seamus yelled as he spun around and brought his gun up. The long blade on the end of his pistol caught Santiago on the side of his head, slicing open the skin. The wound was almost a mirror image of Sibel's. Santiago fell to the floor behind the counter, his hands clutching his torn skin. He didn't scream or yell, but his breath came in ragged gasps. Seamus leapt over the counter. He considered simply shooting the man, but a thought came to him before he could pull the trigger. He raised his foot and then brought it down on the man's face, shattering his nose. Santiago slumped to the floor. Beside him lay the elder Ortega. The wound in Loco's shoulder had stopped bleeding, but it looked like he had lost a great deal of blood and lost consciousness as a result of it. Seamus walked around the corner and inspected Sibel. The wound was bad, but Sibel had suffered worse. Put them over there as well, Seamus said to the large woman as his grin grew wider. We will have a little fun with them. Perdita and Nino peered over the edge of the roof. Below them, a faint light came from a window of the building across the street. They had searched through the town as quietly as they could, not daring to enter any of the buildings if they could help it. Confronting Seamus was one thing, and the two of them were sure they could handle that madman. What concerned them was Killjoy. They weren't sure if they could bring down the creature on their own. Seamus stepped in the doorway and called out, I'll take us. I know you're out there somewhere. He pointed to the building behind him. I have your family in here. I don't want to kill them, but I will if you don't show yourselves. His voice echoed slightly through the buildings. The two Ortegas looked at each other. It's a trap, they whispered together. I only want killjoy, Seamus continued. If you come down and agree to leave this place immediately, then no harm will come to any of you. You have my word. The two nodded at each other and stood up. Hattar, Nino called out. Seamus's head snapped up. We're coming down. Seamus grinned and went back into the building. They made their way down the side of the building, and fell into step beside each other as they crossed the dirt street, Nino on the left and Perdita on the right. They entered the building, their guns in front of them. Please, good people, Seamus said, smiling. There isn't a need for your weapons. See here? He pointed to the corner. Francisco and Santiago were slumped in the chairs with Papa Loco on the floor at their feet. A fat, bald woman stood to the right, a long serrated knife in her left hand was against Francisco's throat, while her right hand held a pistol with a long blade pointed at Santiago, his face and beard covered in blood. To the left, a bell dressed in blue had the point of her parasol pressed against Papa Loco's chest, over his heart. It looks to me like you've already harmed them, and mean to do more, pendejo, Nino says his gun moving between Sibel and the other bell. Perdita's gun was aimed directly at Seamus's head. Seamus smiled broadly and spread his hands. I just wanted to make sure that I wouldn't be harmed. 
Seeing them like this may have caused you to want to take revenge. Considering that you were probably the one that harmed them, the thought has crossed our minds, Nino replied. True, they did get hurt fighting my bells. But I don't see why we can't just go our separate ways and be done with each other. Perdita's glare told him that wasn't going to happen. Please understand, I only want Killjoy for my own purposes, Seamus said. And what would those be, Hatter? Perdita asked, her voice cold. Seamus's smile never faltered. It's a secret. Where's the other one? Nino asked. Other? Nino gestured at Mary with his gun. The other thing? Oh, Lucille. Seamus shook his head slightly and sighed heavily, and then nodded at Francisco. Were you afraid that your brother was able to dispatch her? His gaze fixed on Nino, much like you did to Sarah. For the first time, his smile fell just a bit, and his eyes grew cold. He seemed to give himself a mental shake, and the smile returned. But it's no matter to the hatter. He chuckled slightly at his small rhyme. There are plenty of women to be my bells of the ball. His eyes flickered briefly to Perdita. You're insane, Nino said. The smile finally disappeared. And you are testing my patience, Seamus snapped. He stepped back, his arms still spread. Take your family and go. The offer will not be repeated. Nino sighed. He stepped towards his fallen family members as Perdita fell in step behind him, her gun still trained on Seamus. Nino suddenly stopped, his eyes narrowing. He dropped to one knee, causing Mary to press down on her parasol and threatening to puncture the old man's chest. Nino placed his hand to the ground and then stood back up. The creature is coming, he said. Damn it, Seamus thought. Just a couple more steps and he would have had them. He didn't care so much about the men, he was going to kill them, but slowly, as he did about the woman. She wasn't all that pretty at the moment, but he would fix that and make her into a beautiful belle. Now what do I do? Seamus's mind worked quickly. He was sure that the man was bluffing. If Killjoy was truly still in the area, then all of the fighting from before would have... The thought stopped as the ground trembled under his feet. Dust fell from the ceiling, the motes dancing in the light from the lantern on the table. Seamus looked up, half expecting to see the ceiling caving in from the massive weight of the creature. The back wall exploded in a shower of dust and splinters. Seamus jumped backwards, landed on the counter and rolled off behind it. He peeked over the countertop. Standing in a large hole in the back wall was Killjoy. He was completely nude, his flesh a putrid pink and green colour. A long chain was wrapped around his right arm, his hand grasping the large metal hook on the end. His other hand held a large meat cleaver. A wound ran down the length of his abdomen, held closed only by metal staples. Even with those in place, Seamus could see intestines straining to push through. Killjoy roared, and the foul stench emanating from him doubled. All of the Ortegas, except for the old man, were conscious again, all of them looking at the monster. The bearded one began retching and proceeded to vomit. Seamus snorted in derision. The fool had a weak stomach. Unfortunately, the sound of Seamus's chuckling attracted Killjoy's attention. One heavy foot came down and splintered the wood floor as he made his way into the room. He brought the cleaver down, cutting deep into the counter several feet away from Seamus. Sibel, sensing that her master was in trouble, moved towards Killjoy. The monster saw her coming and with one massive sweep of his arm, knocked her through the far wall. Sibel! Seamus yelled and jumped up. Mary moved in, her parasol raised high and brought it down into Killjoy's incredibly fat thigh. It didn't seem to do any real damage, but it was still enough to draw his attention. He reached out and grabbed the bell with his chained hand, 
She struggled briefly in his grasp as he brought her closer to his face. But his massive hand crushed her skull, her blood and brains oozing through his fingers. Shots rang out as the Ortega woman opened fire, the bullets piercing his body in several places. An even louder gunshot came, and part of Killjoy's right shoulder disappeared. He screamed in pain and anger. In one quick motion, he grabbed one of Mary's legs and pulled it from her body. He tried to shove the whole thing into his mouth, but only part of her thigh would fit. He tossed her useless body to the side and began chewing on the leg, the lower part making small kicking motions. Killjoy moved forward, his bulk making the room seem so much smaller. With the creature focused on the Ortegas, Seamus knew it was a perfect time for him to leave. His bells were destroyed, his satchel was missing, and his gun had flown through the wall with Sabelle. When Killjoy had completely turned towards the Ortegas, Seamus slipped along behind the counter towards the hole that Killjoy had made. When he was only a few feet away from the back wall, Seamus took a deep breath and jumped through. His ears still ringing, he ran a short distance from the building, hoping that perhaps Sibel had survived the blow from Killjoy and the resulting impact. He willed her to come to him, and within moments, she appeared at his side. It was hard to tell just how badly she was wounded, but he knew she would survive. He took his gun from her. Come, my dearest, he said to her as he took her hand. There will be another time to confront this one. Sibel groaned and drooled. Perdita's gun clicked. She cursed and snapped the chamber open as Killjoy brought his heavy cleaver down again, missing her and cutting into the wood floor. Nino's gun fired again, the boomer blowing away part of Killjoy's right arm. As the monster had approached them, they realised that they had almost walked into Seamus's trap. Killjoy's foot had come down on the floor just a couple of feet away from where Nino had been standing moments before, and the floor had completely caved in. The nearby support beam fell with the floor, and part of the ceiling collapsed. While it hadn't seemed to do any real damage to the foul thing, the extra weight had shoved his other massive foot through the floorboards. When he had tried to extract his feet, the broken boards dug into his ankles and stopped him from moving forward. With their path to both the door and the hole in the rear wall blocked off, Santiago and Francisco were trying to pull Papa to safety through the hole that the bell had made after being hit by Killjoy. Santiago, however, was having trouble moving. The rancid odour coming from the monster was too much for him. He kept retching. Francisco, looking as though he was terribly wounded, was having trouble moving Papa and helping his brother. Perdita could see that both of them were missing their guns, so they wouldn't be much help in this fight. We must go! She yelled. Killjoy screamed at them. He brought the cleaver down, narrowly missing Perdita's foot. Her gun now reloaded. She emptied it into the thing's hideous face. One eye blew apart, and bits of flesh and bone flew from the back of his head. The cabron still wouldn't die. She knew as well as the others that they were seriously outmatched here. If that puta Seamus hadn't shown up and made a mess of things, then they might have actually had a chance. Before Francisco could shove Papa outside, Perdita stepped over to him and grabbed a stick of dynamite from the old man's belt. She grabbed his lighter, lit the fuse, and tossed it between the monster's legs. We're going! Now! She yelled. Francisco pushed his father outside and then followed him. She grabbed Santiago and shoved him through the hole as Nino fired another round into the creature's belly. Perdita grabbed the collar of Nino's coat and dragged him behind her towards the exit. He screamed as their progress stopped. She looked over her shoulder and saw the long curved blade impaled into his calf. She dropped him and reloaded as fast as her hands would allow. Killjoy yanked the chain and tore away part of Nino's calf. She brought her gun up once again and emptied it into the thing's other eye. Now blind, Killjoy howled in pain and rage. But Adita grabbed her brother, picked him up and shoved him unceremoniously through the hole in the wall as Killjoy wildly swung both the cleaver and the metal hook. She jumped through and fell on top of her brother as the dynamite went off, 
Shards of wood rained down on her. She didn't look back to see what the damage had been. It wasn't the time. They were all badly wounded, and she knew that they were no match for this abomination, if he still had any fight left. If they were well enough in a couple of days, they could come back here and see if the creature was truly dead. They quickly gathered together and made their way off into the night. Killjoy sank to the floor. He had been so close to so much sweet, sweet meat. The one snack that he had eaten had been sour and rancid. The bullets, the explosives, the wounds, his eyes, none of it mattered. Those things would heal after a fashion over time. The only thing that mattered was the hunger, a hunger that seemed to never be satiated no matter how many treats he ate. Treats. Yes. He knew what his next treats would be. He would make sure that they lived as he devoured them. That's it for another episode of The Weird Chronicles. Join us next time for more tales of action and adventure.